All right, so the last talk of today. Um, I don't know if who else was here in room A just now. That was already a lot of fun. We're actually going to have even more fun right now. Um, so we're going to look at places where JavaScript is not an obvious choice. And then we're going to play around with that a little bit. So 20 minutes of talk, 20 minutes of demo. After that, we can go home. We, well, go home, go drink beer. And have a little more fun. All right, so my name is Jan Jungboom. Um, I'm Dutch, I'm very blonde, and I'm developer evangelist at ARM. ARM is a semiconductor company. ARM makes computer processors, or computer processor designs. 15 billion of our chips ships last year. And I lead a very small team that does greenfield engineering in JavaScript, low power wide area networks, machine learning. Um, and combines that with developer advocism. So this is about a year ago in Tanzania, where we taught 100 uh, mathematics PhDs and 100 ma and mathematics master students how to build their own Internet of Things devices. And that's super cool. We, uh, this, this was literally in Tanzania. We went to a dairy farm where we had cows, actual cows. I know it's, it sounds scary if you're a developer, um, and we made like a, a Fitbit for cows. So what we did was we created the sensor, we attached it to the cow, and then based on that we had data of what the cow was doing and how it was responding to its environment. And we wanted to use that in a couple of ways that feel kind of weird if you're from Western Europe. One of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that they inject the semen samples at the right time. Because these are expensive, they're two to four dollars, which is a lot of money for a dairy farmer in Tanzania. So we wanted to know when the cow was actually in heat, and one of the ways of doing that is by, putting, is by measuring accurate temperature of the cow. So the cow gets more hot when it's in heat. Another thing is that we wanted to predict when a cow was getting sick, so we're doing that through motion patterns. And it's really cool, I think if you give people the power to develop their own devices, and that's also what this talk is going to be a little bit about, how you as JavaScript developers can start doing that, we're going to see um, applications that I can't think about. It's applications that in your society, here in Ukraine, or maybe, maybe wider if you're from outside Ukraine, want to solve, and you can do that through the Internet of Things. So, um, I actually showed the slide three years ago as well. JavaScript is literally everywhere. It's the king of the world. 10 years ago, if you were saying that you were a JavaScript developer, people were staring at you, laughing at you. Right now, it's the hottest thing here. We have 500 people in this audience, all laughing for the kid that used to be fat. I don't think I'm allowed to say that in the US anymore, but here should be fine. Um, but there's one place where JavaScript is not as ubiquitous as everywhere else. I mean, we have it on servers, we have it on mobile phones. But anywhere we see industrial movement, JavaScript is completely obsolete. Uh, it's completely not there. You might see it because you have, a, you have an application that runs part of the factory, but actually where the sensor data is getting in, where, sensor, um, where values are being read, no JavaScript at all. Um, and when, people, when I tell people that, they're, they're often like, well, why do we even care? What is this whole Internet of Things fad anyway? I mean, if I'm thinking about the Internet of Things, I'm thinking about a water bottle that tells your phone how full it is, or <laughs> this is actually true, it's a smart dildo that got hacked. <laughs> um, but the Internet of Things is an amazing opportunity. It's not just the Internet of Things for consumer devices, but way more in the industrial space. Things like parking sensors that know when a car is being parked, a container seal that knows if a container was opened, so they need to like, double check that. Um, electricity pole monitoring. This is an amazing market. Projections, and these are actually arms projections, and is that we're shipping a trillion devices cumulative by 2030. That's way more than all mobile phones and desktop computers and servers combined. And it's kind of weird that we as JavaScript developers are not really caring about this at this point. And this is just one example, General Electric, that said in 2016 that they were going to put a billion dollars in their IoT division. And it's just one of these examples. There's billions and billions and billions of dollars implemented here in Internet of Things, and we as JavaScript developers are not really seeing anything of it. It's going to change. 
the reason of why, why can't we do anything with JavaScript? Why has JavaScript risen to the top of the world in servers, in basically anything consumerism, but not so much in actual devices? And the problem is this little thing. It's a microcontroller. All these smart devices, everything that needs to run on a battery, everyone, everything that needs to be cheap, does not run on a proper application processor. Maybe like the one you find in a Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have multiple cores. It doesn't have gigabytes of RAM. And that's kind of what we need to have a proper JavaScript runtime. If you're looking at V8, for example. Um, Microsoft will have a bunch of really big benefits, and that's what they use so much. That's why 11, 12 billion of them are shipped every year. Like, they're really small. I have, a, have an example here. You might think, oh, that's a relatively big board. But the actual chip here is this big. It's less than one by one centimeter. It's cool. It's also really cheap. This one is one dollar, and that includes a Bluetooth radio. That's cool. Um, they're really efficient uh, in standby mode. You can run them 10 years on a battery. And they have a lot of pins, which is really useful if you want to connect a bunch of sensors or peripherals. Now, of course, this comes with a bunch of downsides. Um, they're really slow, like a typical speed is maximum 100 megahertz. Like this is really is 1995 calling again. Um, RAM is even worse. I mean, 256k of RAM is a lot, and it means that we need to do C or C++ or even assembly. It's kind of weird. I mean, we got rid of that in the 90s. You know, whoever who writes a server here in C++ these days? No one. <laughs> Higher level languages for the win, but we're still stuck here. Um, but yeah, just to show you how, how different a application processor, like a Raspberry Pi, which probably if you're thinking about Internet of Things and JavaScript, you might think Raspberry Pi. But it's never going to scale to actual hundreds of thousands of millions of devices. Like a Raspberry Pi in idle mode consumes 220 milliamps of current. Whereas if we want to run a device for a year on an AA battery, this is the budget that we need to work with. That's about uh, 800 times too much on a Pi. So this is a microcontroller that I had here, actually runs six years on the same battery, including having a Bluetooth radio on and sending a, sending a message every, uh, every second. Um, so that comes to what we're developing here. And you might think, wait, what does this fit in in a JavaScript talk? It gets relevant in a second. So Embedded OS is an operating system for IoT devices. We try to make it a little bit easier to um, to deal with these microcontrollers. So we do stuff like deep sleep automatically and making sure that your code is being portable. But I mean, this is still embedded. This is still C++. It's still kind of a terrible experience. I mean, embedded development is not just in terms of processor speed, not just in terms of RAM. It's also completely in like the developer cycle. It's completely stuck in the 90s. Everything needs to be done in C or C++. Um, a development cycle is typically really long. It's like a minute to just get your code running on a board because you need to compile it and then you need to flash it. Um, IDEs literally look like they're built, in Windows, uh, built for Windows 95, even though they go for like $5,000 a piece. Like as a web developer, as someone who's trained as a web developer and now made the switch to embedded, this is absolutely ridiculous. JavaScript, like the, the, the massive amount of power and force that is currently behind it, uh, like, this is just the, the module count in NPM. It's amazing. We see new IDEs being pumped out on like a, on like a weekly basis. Visual Studio Code, that just came out two years ago, is now the most popular IDE, according to the Stack Overflow research from last week. Embedded development doesn't have anything of this. Here, we think if, you know, we had a little chat, and we're discussing a framework from 2014, that's supposed to be old. And here I am, programming my embedded device still in C++03, which is 14 years old, 15 years old by now. So what can we do? So what can we do to actually bridge those two worlds? <laughs> the JavaScript hipsters, which you all are here. Any of that depth? So we'll, I want to bring those worlds together. You know, I am. I want. Uh, well, I am a web developer by heart. This is where I started out. And I just went down the line because I wanted to use these microcontrollers. I wanted to build stuff that runs six years on a battery. That's amazing. So we need to go to this hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually literally what you get if you type old hipster MacBook in uh, Google. Um, 
so today, let me just take a look at what we have in time. Today I want to talk to you about two projects. Um, one is a project, uh, both of the projects are being developed in my team. Well, not of course just in my team, but in a wider, uh, in a wider ecosystem. One is a way of running JavaScript actually on these microcontrollers, in this little RAM. And the second thing is, what if we approach this from a different standpoint? What if we're looking at like, the pain points of embedded development, using old IDEs, uh, taking a minute to flash stuff, and put a little bit of web magic on top of it through a simulator? Um, so first of all, like, why would I want to use JavaScript over C++? Well, it's the same reasons why we've gotten rid of C++ in a lot of other functionality. Who's writing a desktop app right now in C++? Almost no one. Everyone uses JavaScript, Electron, as long as you don't write a game. Servers are written in, in Go or in, or in OGS, not in C++ anymore. C++ is a terrible language. Sec faults, one, <laughs> one of errors. You know, pointers, who, who likes pointers? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> one person. <laughs> two, pers two people, <laughs> right. Um, you know, there's, there's memory management, there's sec faults. Um, Porting to different platforms is often very hard. For JavaScript, the event system is, is a purely natural fit as well. Like an Internet of Things device, if I think about an, an embedded device or an IoT device, very often what I want to do is respond to events and then maybe send a signal somewhere. That's stuff we do always in the browser. We're completely used to doing this event-based programming. When Ryan Dahl invented Node.js, he first invented the evented system in, in libuv. And only after that, he realized, well, JavaScript is a perfect fit because everyone already knows events. This is how we've been programming for the last 20 years. This is a really nice fit for embedded as well. The downsides, of course, is we have very limited power on these devices, and running an additional VM has an additional cost. Um, your abstraction may leak. You know, at some point, you might need to realize that you're actually dealing with hardware, and hardware has its limitations. And the last thing is that embedded developers will yell at you. I see two here already in front of me. <laughs> this was a comment on Reddit after I released this project. <laughs> so, um, However, th th this didn't stop us, of course. So um, for the last uh, three years or something, JerryScript has been in development. And this is a JavaScript virtual machine, originally started by Samsung, but with development now being taken over by uh, the JavaScript Foundation. Um, it's being developed by the University of Seged in Hungary, uh, by Intel, by ARM, by Samsung, and by various other partners, uh, Texas Instruments. And what is cool is that it gives you a complete ECMAScript 5.1 compatible JavaScript VM with a couple of like ES6 stuff sprinkled on top of it that runs in just 64 kilobytes of RAM and 200 kilobytes of ROM. I think this is cool. And for the last three years, it started out as like a research project out of Samsung Research. But we see products being shipped with it right now. If you have a Fitbit Ionic, the new uh, smartwatch from Fitbit, you can run JavaScript apps on it, but it's still a microcontroller. They actually use this. Have you seen Intel's new smart classes, the Intel Vant? So it uses lasers to like, shoot stuff in your eye and then use that for AR. Also runs JavaScript, also with this. So really cool. So this is something we're developing. ARM is part of this. But it's just a VM, similar to V8. We still need some bindings. Um, so that's where our embed project came in. We already tried to make it easy for embedded developers to make programming easier. Um, but if you combine it with, Java, with JerryScript, we can run JavaScript on 100 different boards without needing to port anything. So that's what we've been doing, JavaScript and embeds. So it's right now the best of both worlds. It runs on 40 boards already. Um, most of the critical paths are actually written in C++ because we can't have the performance penalty on everything. Like sometimes stuff is really timing sensitive. Like I have LED drivers and I need to write the driver in assembly, but I can still have a JavaScript binding to actually expose it. Um, what is really nice about running JavaScript now is that because it has an event loop and it's single threaded by nature, I know exactly when my events are going to happen. If I set a set interval for one second, I can sleep in between. Super nice. So you get nice deep sleep capabilities out of the box, which is cool. We actually have a beacon. I'm going to run it uh, in a sec. 
that runs JavaScript, has this whole, whole application implemented in JavaScript, and it can run off a coin cell for a year. Which is cool. That excites me. Um, so yeah, you can write your application in JavaScript. looks a little bit like this. Very simple. I declare a pin as, a, as an outboard. I toggle it on and off, and then I got a little LED that blinks. In between, I can go to sleep. Very nice. Um, so getting started. We have uh, about 40 different development boards that currently support this. Um, so you buy the dev board, they go from about $9. You clone our REPL example, you throw it on the board, and that's it. And then you get something like this. So this is a bit like the browser console, but now you can interact with hardware. I'm going to show you this in a demo in a sec. Um, yeah, so if you want to talk to sensors, all possible. We have digital, analog, um, that kind of stuff is out of the box. After that, you can also port drivers that you write in C++ for anything that's timing sensitive. Like we have a Bluetooth stack, but the Bluetooth stack is written in C++, not in JavaScript, because timing is really important. And then we can generate wrappers through, um, through the MBGS wrapper generator. So current state, $9, the cheapest dev board that you can get. The microcontroller on it is less than $2. Um, C++ and JavaScript binders can be generated. Uh, ARM is committing to this. We have about 20 people working on it full time in the JavaScript foundation. A bunch of tools and it's ready to go. So play around with that. I'll show you that in a sec. Now let's do it from the other from the other end. What if we don't want to run JavaScript on a microcontroller, but rather bring a bunch of like the development tools that we know from the web? You know, instant feedback. Um, no need to compile or to flash unless you use Webpack and then you need to compile and. Don't want to go into that discussion. So the feedback cycle is really slow. You write a little bit of code, you compile it, um, you flash it on the board, takes a minute, then you need to go back into the right state, which might be really hard. Testing frameworks can help a little bit, but also not too much. And then you verify, and then you keep doing this. It's a slow, painful process, especially because, well, it's C++. If I mistype something somewhere, and I segfault straight away, that's 10 minutes extra out of development time for me. Um, so I was looking at the BBC Microbits, it's a little board that I had here. Um, this was given to a million kids in the UK, between 10 and 11 years old, to learn them how to program computers as part of their official curriculum, which I think is awesome. Like, I really wanted to have that. So they get a little development board. They get a, little, they get a code editor here, so they can just drag and drop blocks. And they can run it on a board. But what I thought was awesome is that you can just run your application straight in the browser, and then it will just emulate it. And this is a really powerful learning tool, because you don't need to flash. Your, de your development cycle gets a lot faster. Now, unfortunately, they do this because they have this, this pseudo language in place. And they can either cross-compile it to JavaScript or to C++. So I kind of wanted like, exactly what they were doing, but then I just wanted to write normal code for this embedded device. Luckily, what, we, what in Mozilla happened is that they also wanted something to cross-compile from C++ to the web, and that's mscripten project. So if you've ever played a game that was, uh, at some point was the, the Humble Bundle, they had a bunch of web games, those were all cross-compiled. They were written for the desktop, cross-compiled to the web through mscripten, um, and that translates OpenGL calls into WebGL calls. It translates C++ into WebAssembly, or actually the bytecode into WebAssembly. is really cool. So I figured I have a C++ application with, you know, the app. I got my embed OS, my operating system, and then it just toggles physical pins on the hardware, toggles registers. So what if we get rid of that and then replace that with a JavaScript-based thing, something that runs in the browser? Now, 95% of my code, I can just cross-compile, and now I can run the complete environment, everything that I normally do on my development board, straight in the browser, which is really powerful. Um, so this is uh, what we built, Embed Simulator. On the left, you get your code. And you can just run stuff on your development board, same way as you would normally do. You can add new components. And the cool thing is that the, the actual code that you run here is exactly the same code as you can run on the development board. And this is cool. Like this is something that we in the web, in, as web developers, have had for a really long time. 
If I change something, if I add a new library, I just press refresh and it runs. By using these tools, everything that comes out of the web ecosystem, we not just get an, a development environment where I can run stuff straight away, I can also use source maps um, to actually debug my, my code here. So, and a runtime environment and a debugging environment, all I get for free because the web is so freaking awesome. Because everyone already wanted this, because you guys wanted to use ba a Babel to use ES6 shit in you know, your old browsers. So they invented source maps. Beautiful. Now I can, now I can abuse this as well. Um, this is a really cool demo of another project that we did. Um, MicroTensor is a, is a tool to run TensorFlow models, so machine learning models, on these tiny microcontrollers. The development of that is, of course, slow, because you know, so much stuff can break. So now we run that actually in the browser, and now we've got a machine learning framework. And this does uh, digit recognition with the uh, MNIST data set. So this is powerful also for development. So regardless of which direction we choose, whether we choose to use JavaScript on the micro or bring a little bit of the development uh, runtime that we have in the browser to embed it, it's cool. Like both of these directions are cool, I think. Um, so, current state, I'll show you it in a sec. Um, we have standard I.O. that's working, we have networking, that's all working. It's a small set of peripherals that are just web components, so you can, you can run that yourself if you want. Um, that's all going to be integrated. The only thing you need to do is just go to the web page, it even works on mobile. And you can start toying around with that. Um, so, let's do that. This is my good Ukrainian friend. <laughs> Right, so this is, uh, this is my development uh, board. I um, actually brought a few of them, so we can actually run some JavaScript on them. So what you see here is um, what it essentially does is just it declares one pin, the pin mapped to LED1 as an out board, and then just flicks it on and off. Now whenever I click Run, it transpiles this or cross-compiles this to JavaScript, pushes the JavaScript down to the to the browser, and then I can run that. So we have a bunch of other peripherals here. Um, let's say that I want a response to whenever someone clicks on the button. So in that case, we want to toggle LED2. I click on it, now LED2 goes on. It's the one you see there. Um, now let's do something more interesting. Have a peripheral. So this is an LCD display. It's very low res, but you know, hey, what do you want? <laughs> so it currently shows Happy Christmas. So I had the liberty to look what uh, um, Good Morning or something in uh, Ukrainian was, but unfortunately the display driver didn't have Cyrillic. But I was told it's something like, uh, shit, I wrote it down. Privet? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, you'll believe me, you know, I, I, I cross compile something that runs in here. So now let's make it interesting. So I have a development board that has the same display on here. And I'll show you that you can actually use the same code that you now run in the browser to also run it on these boards, drastically reducing the feedback, cycle, the feedback loop that you need to do. So let's plug it in. I'll uh, put a camera on it so you can see it better. Um, so, I just copy, uh, copy everything here to my uh, IDE. Um, I compile and I flash this application, then I'm going to switch to my phone for the camera. Oh. So, oh, that's me. Also very pretty to look at, I understand that, but we want to see this. All right, so it's uh, flashing, and at this point, yay. 
Yay, on real hardware. <laughs> And the cool thing is we can do this on a lot of other peripherals. We can even do it with our networking stacks. Um, so simple stuff like a TCP socket, which all looks, you know, which is really hard to test because you need to have a network and the network needs to work. And sometimes I'm sitting in a plane and I don't, you know, I don't want to get up my dev board. All the stuff that we can make really easy this way. All right. So that was the simulator side. So now look at um, running JavaScript on these devices. So I took the liberty to uh, create a little dev board. Um, it has a, so this is a microcontroller. This is like a development board. So you use a development board because the microcontroller itself is really tiny. You know, it's, I'm not going to solder any peripherals on it. So I took uh, like 40 LEDs on top of it, uh, a little uh, temperature sensor, and a little buzzer, which is going to be really annoying. But deal with it. Uh, and I'm running our JavaScript stack on it. So this thing has, uh, runs on 96 megahertz and has 256K of RAM. So really underpowered. So this is what you see when you start up the board. Um, so JavaScript REPL running. So it's very similar to what you normally see in the browser. You can just type stuff. One plus one is two. So let's do something with this hardware. So I tell the thing that there's a buzzer on uh, pin D3. <laughs> I didn't say it was not annoying. <laughs> um, but there's more peripherals on here. So, so you can actually change the, the face here. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. Whatever, we can skip over that. Um, so there's a there's a little so for like little stuff, like for example anything that's analog or digital, um, you can just respond to events very quickly. So let's say I make a button, uh, which is an interrupt. So I want to know when the state changes. Uh, I can say, and now whenever I press this button on my board, it falls. Similar with the temperature sensor that I have, I can say uh, this is just an analog sensor. So, of course, this doesn't mean anything to you. So we can use a, a small calculation to actually turn this into, into degrees Celsius. Um, and this also shows like how how nice it actually is, is to develop for something like this. Instead of having to recompile my whole application to show this, I can just key it in here um, and test my algorithms out straight away. So this is essentially the algorithm, get temperature. Um, I have it here a little bit compact. Um, it's 23 degrees in here. So whenever I hold my finger on this, so it's the trimester, it's the analog sensor, so it should go up. <laughs> well, maybe I'm just really cold. <laughs> Whatever, 22 degrees anyway. <laughs> um, but so for more uh, interesting components, so stuff where timing is important or that are, that are more interesting than just like reading and writing to pins, uh, we can load complete drivers in here. And these drivers can be written in C or in assembly, depending on what you need. So the LEDs on this board, they have very precise timing, like microseconds specific to drive them. So this driver is written in assembly. But we have a generator, just a Node.js program, that can then generate JavaScript bindings for it. So put it here. I hope you guys can see it in the back. Yeah, I'll put it up in a sec. So I can just declare it like a normal JavaScript object and then say, now it's red. Woo, pretty. Um, and I can do interesting stuff with it, like, for example, make it race over the screen. Ooh. <laughs> or throw in, you know, yet another sensor, in this case, the accelerometer that's on the board, and do something depending on whether the, whether the device is up or down. 
So I create two, two objects. Um, I read the data, and then if it's, uh, if it's flipped over, I'll make the screen green. If, it, if it's flipped up, I'll make the screen blue. And let's run this. Ooh. Oh, so the other code is still running, so that's still making the thing toggle. And I want to turn it over. Now it becomes green. So it's super easy to just take a bunch of sensors and start mocking up code. And I think it's super powerful. Because everyone, you know, whether you're JavaScript developer, you know, or someone who just wants to play around with code, can just grab this, don't need to compile anything, just connect it to your computer and start toying with sensors. And this is for me like the most fun that I've had in, in years. You know, no more frameworks and bullshits and discussions. The only thing I need to do is get a couple of sensors and start mocking things up. Now, of course, this is not an Internet of Things device because there's no connectivity. So we got something for that as well. Um, so we have Bluetooth drivers. Um, and these are super simple as well. So what I can tell is I want a, a BLE device. Um, I have a heart rate sensor here. So I'm actually putting that on my ear. It's an earbud sensor. Um, I can uh, create a, so Bluetooth works with services and characteristics. You don't even need to know about it. But important here is this is, the, this is what is being run when a phone connects to the device. Um, and this is the name under which I can find it. And then I read the heart rate every second. And whenever the device is connected, I tell that to the phone, whatever the, the code is. So let's connect this device. Um, and because we put the device into sleep in between automatically, this thing can actually run a year on the battery. So let's open. So I'm getting a little bit more tense, you know. My heart rate was 61 earlier. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the reading is a little bit jittery because it's like a touch to your ear. But the interesting part, what I want to show you is now. So I have a. So what I have here on my phone is uh, like, a, like a Bluetooth Explorer. So because this implements the normal Bluetooth APIs for heart rate, this thing will actually work with your Strava and with any other, other phone on your application, or your uh, application on your phone. So I go to the heart rate monitor. I click Connect. Um, and it finds my JavaScript heart rate monitor, all wireless. So whenever I click it, it will start. So it tells me get connected, and I will start plotting actually my heart rate. So in 50 lines of code, I can write an actual application that uses sensor data, all in JavaScript, to connect to my phone. And that without having to compromise on battery life. This is still going to get nice battery life. You know, there's a battery holder on it. I can run it from that. I think this is super powerful. Um, I think this is. This could be, and I don't know if this is going to be it, but this is one of the things that I want to focus on. Like, how can we bring JavaScript and IoT a bit closer? Because the feeling that you get for the first time when you connect to you know, your own device from your phone and you see data actually flowing into the apps that you normally use, that feeling is so absolutely tremendous. Um, and I, I really want to give you guys, you guys that. So um, to recap, you know? I think JavaScript and the Internet of Things, even though we're, we're not there yet, maybe not even close, you know, we need to get our virtual machines running on these devices. And they need to be more efficient. But the, the combination of these things is going to be absolutely amazing. Whether we're actually going to use it to, to actually write firmware for these devices, or whether we're going to use it to make, it, to make better development tools. No, but the actual combination is absolutely awesome. You know, bringing a JavaScript VM to microcontrollers introduces a bunch of new opportunities. All of a sudden, everyone here in the room is an IoT developer, and not just an IoT developer that can get a Raspberry Pi, 
and then hook up like a, like a car battery to it and then get a day battery life out of it. No, something you can actually run for a long time on a battery and it's actually cheap. The other way around is also very valuable. You know, simulating IoT devices is going to take a really big leap. This is going to be cool, this shortens development cycle, and it's only because we have the tools that the web development community through Mscripten, through, through source map, etc., gave us. So keep doing what you're doing. JavaScript, IoT, all awesome. Let's build this thing together. Thank you. Okay, so now we have some time for questions. So raise your hand if you want to ask question. Yes, and we'll come. Hello, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I have a very short question. Uh, a few or something like years ago, I heard about the lib named the Johnny Five. Yeah, it's about uh, is it work and is it to do how to co cooperate with them or how it works right now? So Johnny Five is a is a JavaScript library for robotics. That's that's essentially what it was built for. Um, it's really cool because it, it brings a lot of drivers to the table. So drivers for accelerometers, drivers for motor drivers, etc. The downside is that it's currently tied to Node.js. Um, so you need to run it on, on Node. So it's, it's for prototyping. Um, you can use it with Arduino, but the needs that all your code needs to run on your computer. So I'm, um, this project tries to go a little bit deeper. I do like their API design. So I expect that at some point we'll release something that's compatible with that so you can reuse all your Johnny 5 drivers also uh, with this project. OK, thank you. So any uh, other questions? Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question. Um, what about uh, project generator for ARM uh, Micro microprocessors uh, pro progr uh, projects. Um, project because generator. Because I, I have some experience with uh, developing for STM, and yep. uh, they uh, have uh, has uh, STM cube. Yep. What about ARM? So uh, what we try to do is not discriminate. Um, so our tools work also with STM32 uh, cube but also with Visual Studio Code, Eclipse, etc. And on, on top of that, we try to build a complete ecosystem. So that's a real-time operating system, that's drivers, but also networking stacks, IPv4, IPv6, um, uh, file systems, all that. And that's something that we can leverage now that we have JavaScript on top of it. Um, I think that's why we can go a little bit faster than uh, traditional. And scaffolding of new applications okay, comes natural from that. OK, thank you. So if you want to see either the simulator or the JavaScript project, uh, labs.ember.com has them both plus some other uh, really cool projects that my team has been putting out. Uh, I'm sorry, what about sensors? Do you have cell sensors? Do you have some GPS sensor and not R-type, but real, real GPS? Yep. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. seems so fine. We have, um, I think, 800 components right now. Um, so not all of them are wrapped in JavaScript yet, but that's why we have the wrapper generator for it. So today, the heart rate sensor was not in JavaScript. One more question. Can I work with uh, computer recognition and computer video uh, with this? Um, or it will um, it have not enough power to do it? Computer vision in general is a little bit, uh, yeah. With computer vision, it would take something a bit faster, like a Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, for, for other stuff, uh, it's, um, like recognition of things, uh, pattern recognition, we have MicroTensor, which is like our deep learning uh, AI framework that can run mm. on these devices. And it, that's really suitable <coughs> for this kind of thing. And uh, uh, as far as I understand, it's good for prototyping, but if you want to create series of device, uh, for example, project and yep. uh, multiply them, uh, you should uh, create something else? So what you do is, so you develop on the development board, then you take the little microcontroller, well, off. Well, you don't really literally take it off, but you go to the manufacturer and you say, I want 10,000 of these microcontrollers. Um, then you put it on your own PCB together with all the other sensors, but the code will stay exactly the same. So this scales from, from one to millions of devices. Great, thank you. No problem. So Baidu, actually, Baidu made a, made a, like a smart speaker. 
um, similar to Alexa. And they're also running like the same software on it. So they actually scale from one to, I think, 10 million devices shipped. That was a question from him. <laughs> uh, is there any um, considered API for Internet of Things in general to communicate to server uh, to collect all the data from the sensors? There's a couple. Of, there's a couple. Um, MQTT is very often used, which is a lightweight protocol. Um, there's CoAP, constrained application protocol, where it also tries to do the same. And then there's a couple of application protocols, like lightweight machine to machine. Um, there's not really a clear winner at this point. But uh, there's a wide variety. Um, I have a demo application of MQTT on, on JavaScript for MMET already uh, listed on my GitHub page. So uh, sorry, is there any, anyone? Uh -huh. I think I was supposed to give out a t-shirt. So if you, if you ask a question now, you'll get one, I think. I have a question. Good. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, really nice presentation. Thank you. I, I have a question about supporting of modern ECMAScript syntax. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do is get ES5.1 completely compatible. Um, now we're adding a couple of features depending on where we seem fit. So promises is one of the, the things. Um, async await would be something that I would like to have, but it's relatively hard to implement because very limited RAM, very limited ROM, so we want to keep stuff as small as possible. Um, we're adding more people to the team. So uh, we are actually hiring one person now to work on this full time. Uh, Intel has, I think, five or six people working on it. Samsung has been working on it. So we think that what we've done so far is get something that's completely is 5 to 1 compatible, and now we can grow further and go faster um, okay, without understand. compromising. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much. Very excited. Uh, I have two questions, two small questions. First question is about garbage collector, yep. uh, how this works. And the second uh, is about scoping, closure, things like this. Can we use it? And is this really relative for this? Yeah. So scoping rules work exactly the same. Um, scoping rules work exactly the same as a normal ECMAScript or JavaScript. Um, Garbage, yeah. So there is a garbage collector that's also there. We use reference counting internally, also reference counting of all our C++ objects, because they, they wrap around it. Um, but, it's always a but here, like you are limited in RAM. So we have tools that, that give you like an overview of whatever is on the heap, and that gets a little bit more important than, it, than in the browser. If you allocate a two megabyte buffer or whatever, or you, you keep adding stuff to an array, at some point you just run out of heap space. Um, so we try to help a little bit with that. Um, internally, we, we reference count everything, so make sure that we don't leak anything there. But if you keep pushing stuff to uh, to our upper scope and we need to keep a reference, then running out of memory is definitely a possibility. Um, one of the ways of doing it is that you can limit the JavaScript heap, so not the rest of your application will also crash, and then you can just restart the VM whenever possible. So that's what Fitbit, for example, uses in their smartwatch. That's a lot of questions, guys. So, yeah. We've got one more T-shirt, and we've got one more question, I one guess. More, one more T-shirt, one more question. Where are the microphones? Only here? What kind of beer I like is a very valid question. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I have a question. Why did you choose uh, JavaScript for this uh, purpose? Uh, it's because event system, or you just uh, try to uh, unify all the development process so the JavaScript developer can do all uh, things. Um, because, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, because uh, as I thought, uh, there are a lot of uh, specific things. So if uh, I'll write uh, this in C++ with uh, some bullet or with JavaScript, uh, I need uh, to learn uh, much new stuff uh, and uh, it uh, has uh, some problems. And uh, yeah. is the uh, JavaScript uh, best choose for these things? So, well, I'm at a JavaScript conference, so of course it's the best choice. Um, <laughs> so, no, there's a, there's a variety of other dynamic languages. Um, MicroPython has its own version with MicroPython, which is very widely adopted, especially in the educational scene. Um, and we're definitely looking at that. But, like, for us, the very first choice that we wanted to focus on was JavaScript, because it's the largest language in the world, whether you like it or not. If it's the best language in the world, I don't know, but it's definitely the largest. So for us, it was a really natural fit. Um, and combined that with the event system that 
that combines in a, in a really nice development environment, at least for me. Thank you. All right, thank you.